great to be with you. I think it's imperative that the U.S. does reestablish deterrence in ways that are not just limited to sanctions, but given that sanctions are the primary tool that the U.S. is using to both deny the regime of revenue as well as to get Iran to come to the negotiating table, as well as to punish the regime in Tehran for past transgressions of international norms, it makes sense that sanctions will lead the way here. I think what the, what's more important than Washington's strategy here is Tehran's strategy, because Tehran is looking to seal out, to suss out where those even pink lines may be, and then to gradually put a toe just over that line, much like the Soviet Union did during the Cold War. I keep coming back to that myself in terms of, uh, you know, how closely this does resemble, in a sense, a standoff that we saw um, between Kennedy and Khrushchev uh, in terms of the Cuban Missile Crisis, how close we realized much later that we came uh, to, to a real conflict there. My question, of course, going forward here is when we talk about miscalculation, I had the chance to catch up with U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo back in May, on May 12th, actually, and I asked him how worried he is about the potential for a problem given so much military hardware in the region, and the fact that it doesn't seem that Tehran and Washington are communicating at all. Listen in to what he told me. We're not going to miscalculate. Uh, our, our aim is not war. Our, our aim is a change in the behavior of the Iranian leadership. We hope the Iranian people will get what they finally want, what they so richly deserve. Now, he said there, we're not going to miscalculate. We're looking for a change, as uh, he was saying, from actual leadership in Tehran, but we're still not seeing much from them in terms of a change in the rhetoric, are we? Well, no. Iran has long used rhetoric to both bolster and obfuscate the reality of its destabilizing foreign security policy in the region. Sometimes rhetoric does the heavy lifting of Iran's foreign policy. You know, Iran doesn't have the financial resources, going back to our analogy to the Soviet Union, of the Soviet Union. It is fundamentally a, a, tier, a tier three conventional military power that exists uh, in a faraway region. So Washington does have a lot of tools here at its disposal to do exactly what the Secretary said. The question is, as the Iranians realize uh, how risk-averse the U.S. may be in some theaters, it gradually can capitalize on those low-cost tools and get a very, very high return on investment. You know, Washington, you know, whether it's the secretary or Representative Hook or the president or others who talk about not wanting a war or not wanting a conflict or not wanting to miscalculate, um, I believe that. I believe that's quite correct because Washington is looking to thread the needle here and be very, very careful. The question is, once this is said publicly, the Iranians may be able to realize where those red lines are and may be able to actually embarrass the United States. I think it's been once or twice now since 2018 uh, that U.S. officials have said that, Iran, that America would hold Iran responsible for the activities of its proxies. And to the best of my knowledge, it hasn't done that yet. So the more Iran sees this, the more it's incentivized to double down and try to say, you know the old saying, a petty road vote speaks softly and carry big stick. Iran is trying to marshal the international community against America by saying, under the Trump administration, Washington speaks loudly and carries no stick.